The most general formulation of the religious problem is the question whether the process of the temporal world passes into the formation of other actualities bound together in an order in which novelty does not mean loss. Alfred North Whitehead Life is the anarchic and continuous creation of unforeseeable novelty. And theology is the premier discipline that nails us down as subjects amidst the forces at play. Unfortunately, the theological enterprise has since its inception been permeated by a reactive desire to invoke a transcendence to which immanence effectively can be attributed. The functioning of theology has thus been to exercise power over life, to judge and to crucify the novel, singular and rare, in accordance with established values. Which is why the secular revolt against theology in the West was critical. However, while the secularist's negative gesture has proved itself relatively forceful, it has rarely been violent enough. Rather than opening up fields of virtuality, they retained their cloaked predecessor's representational logic and thus failed in their attempts to replace the basic structure of imperial Christian thought. As Deleuze writes, did we kill God when we put man in his place and kept the most important thing, which is the place? Rather than allowing for their critique to function in the service of their differential affirmation, the secularists have failed to break open that which they struggle against. In truth, secularism functions within the frame of Christianity and should not be viewed as anything but a segment of a manifold and incalculable world religion. Deleuze continues, The only change is this, instead of being burdened from the outside, man takes the weight and places them on his own back. It is therefore no wonder that so much intellectual energy has been spent wrestling with issues concerning the unconscious the past century, and how the unconscious keeps echoing the life-denying verdicts of the despotic priesthood. According to Deleuze and Guattari, the judgment of God is the operation of he who makes an organism to extract useful labor from the body without organs. All while the body without organs howls back, he has made me an organism, he has wrongfully folded me, he has stolen my body. The territorializing verdicts proclaimed by the high priests thus nails us down as subjects, against the body without organs. Note, however, that our subjectivity is not strictly opposed to the body without organs, because the body without organs is not separate from it, rather it exists in it. Nothing is, so to speak, deeper than the skin, which is why Nietzsche wrote that the Greeks were superficial, out of profundity. I am thoroughly convinced that we cannot escape theology. It is of course possible to follow the secularists and exchange the word God for something other, but if our will to power is still turned upon itself, if we desire domination rather than creation, then what's the difference? I am much more interested in a free-spirited theology that refuses to acknowledge any attempts by established authorities to limit our imagination, and which simultaneously acknowledge that we cannot begin anywhere but in the middle of our own experience of being nailed down as subjects. Our task, as I see it, is therefore not to throw ourselves into suicidal collapse, nor is it to conquer the cathedrals of established religion, but to carefully evaluate and distinguish the body without organs from its totalitarian doubles, to find lines of flight, and as Deleuze and Guattari writes, have a small plot of new land at all times. Therefore, the theme for the upcoming season of the Catacombic Machine is Desert Islands, which is the title of a short essay written by Deleuze early in his philosophical career. The small plot of new land, here described as a desert island, is both a necessary minimum needed to begin anew, and a second origin that establishes the law of repetition which is a law of becoming that recognizes that opposition presupposes difference. The law of repetition is thus indifferent to any eternal code of unification, any logic of the one or pure origin. 
Being is not given once and for all, and novelty does not mean loss. Rather, I suggest that theology must begin with the affirmation of difference, and that it be understood as a futuristic and artistic practice of opening up fields of virtuality. To paraphrase Guattari, theologians must therefore demonstrate that they have abandoned their priestly and academic cloaks, beginning with those invisible ones that they wear in their heads, in their language, and in the way they conduct themselves. This is, I think, how we can create fresh and affirmative processes of subjectification. In this season's premiere of The Catacombic Machine, I will speak to Bryce Maxwell, who is one of several new voices that you will get to know much better over the coming year. Bryce has been on the podcast once before, on the second to last show last season, as I published a lecture by him on Deleuze and Guattari's concepts, the body without organs and faciality. And that's where we will begin this season, by unpacking some of the things Bryce talked about in his lecture. Enjoy. I guess a good place to start would be uh, when looking at the body without organs. Um, it can be a pretty abstract concept to try and come to terms with. And I, and I think, at least for me, to, to wrap my head around the concept and what it means and how I might apply it and theoretically uh, move around with it. Um, it comes down to three things or the three sort of discourses that, that are behind their postulation of the concept. Um, so first and foremost, which I, I think I reference it, like, like you said, very compactedly and quickly in the lecture, because I only had 20 minutes, but the body without organs is, is something that you can't properly conceive of or think of if you're not taking into consideration the extent to which Deleuze and Guattari are um, successors, so to speak, even though they were working at the same time, um, successors of Foucault and his notion of biopower and biopolitics. And, and so Foucault's critique of uh, the advancement in medical technology, um, his earliest work, The History of Madness, when he talks about uh, liberal technologies um, and, and the, the age of confinement and it becoming internalized through psychoanalysis and so on and so forth. He also has the same view about uh, how medical technologies advance and come to uh, essentially constrain the body. They come to uh, use a term of Deleuze and Guattari's uh, or borify it or arborize it. And, and so for me, the body without organs is their means towards escaping the organism, which is something that is uh, prescribed onto uh, the, the subject from the top down, so to speak, whether it be state oppressor or, or what, what have you. So, I mean, we could probably spend the whole time talking about Foucault's notion of biopolitics and how it goes into that. But that's sort of, I think, being slightly versed in Foucault and knowing what he was trying to accomplish, that helps with understanding the body without organs. But then additionally, body without organs, um, it, it's, it's also rooted in uh, clinical symptomatology. So I referenced in the, the lecture how crucial it is to understand that Guattari uh, was working at a Laborde clinic with Jean Ori with schizophrenic patients. So he's working on the ground and a lot of the, the terminology and a lot of his theory, at least his half of it, <laughs> comes from his experiences in that very practical place. And uh, it, it wasn't uh, surprising to him to when he was in a session, say, with, with a schizophrenic um, or a paranoid schizophrenic or someone who was delusional, that, that they would become paranoid about certain organs in their body, controlling them or doing certain things. So, well, in my roundabout way of, of uh, talking about the body without organs, I think you got to know some of Foucault, biopower, biopolitics, um, and then you can think of Deleuze and Guattari's uh, advocation for becoming a body without organs as a sort of response to the, the problem of, of biopower, biopolitics. And uh, that strata that binds us, so to speak, that's using some of their own words. Um, and then secondly, it, it's really helpful to, to understand that the language itself is, is highly informed, as I said, by Guattari's experiences in clinical situations. Granted, they're not trying to say that, that as a sort of approach towards subjectivity that we should in fact become schizophrenics who should be put in a clinic or anything like that, but, but they, 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 they extract um, something very that, that's processual and that's that's useful out of I think uh, 
that that schizophrenic um, experience, so to speak. You have the notion in anti Oedipus how how the schizophrenic cannot say I. The schizophrenic isn't trapped by the powers that be. They they also use the term nailed down as a subject of one. You know, in in a Christian conversation, you could talk about Christ here and how how he's truly nailed down. <laughs> right. You've you've organized him <laughs> with a little hyphen between you know organ and eye you know if people listen to this podcast they're familiar with Deleuze and Guattari uh, but there's always going to be someone new so I was thinking I, would, I just want to say something about the body without organs yeah and maybe we can riff on that you know oh, of course to sort of help people understand what we're talking about right so right. they write in a, in, in a thousand plateaus that the body without organs is what remains when you take everything away what you take away is precisely the fantasy, the signifiances, and the subjectifications as a whole. The body without organs howls back. They've made me an organism. They've wrongfully folded me. They've stolen my body. And they do so for the purpose of extracting useful labor. And so it's always this sort of extraction of labor from the body without organs. And to do that, you need to organize it. You need an organization to make it work for you. I think an interesting question here is because someone would say, well, so if you just try to advocate the body without organs, then isn't that sort of suicidal? If, if all organization goes. Sure, sure. Well, and it's funny that there is that complaint. And then I wonder if if they've read if they say they've read Deleuze and Guattari, and they have, and they, if they ask they, that question, they haven't read. <laughs> right, it's a rhetorical question. Right, well, and that's my question: is that they obviously haven't read it because Deleuze and Guattari also caution against that. Um, you can go too far in the process. Um, with the the three strata that bind us, they say are the the organism. So there's the reference to biopower, biopolitics, and then as you said already, uh, signifiance, um, which is their. Uh, signifier signified relationship which that goes into you know structural linguistics and the structural approach towards the unconscious um towards society so on and so forth and then that third strata is subjectivation um, or subjectification you know we can use those words interchangeably but yeah you you don't go too far i think deleuze and guattari also say in a thousand plateaus somewhere that you still have to wake up with enough organism in the morning you know, that you, you can't just rapidly empty yourself out entirely. And I mentioned it in the lecture or the, the talk that the organ isn't necessarily the enemy of the, uh, the, the body without organs. It's just the, the, the organism. Right. It's, and, and it doesn't really matter how, what kind of organization. Right. It's organization per se. Right. And so the body without organs and this, it's not a sort of dichotomy. Right. That where you have good versus evil or something like that. Right. Organs are bad. The body without them is good. Yeah, it it, it can't get broken down that, that simply. The passage you referred to says you have to keep enough of the organism for it to reform each dawn. Right. And you have to keep small supplies of signifiance and subjectification, if only to turn them against their own system when <laughs> right. circumstances, demands, and so on. Something that I've been thinking about for quite some time is how, how to talk about this sort of catacombic cathedral dualism that I've painted in order to make a point. Right. Because it, it it's all too common that people's like, yeah, we're in the catacombs now. We hate uh -huh. the cathedrals. And so it's just sort of a slave morality kind of way of relating to the powers that be. You just turn things around and says, okay, so now we're, we're the good ones and they're the evil ones. We're the catacombic people. <laughs> the thing is that what is catacombic is in the cathedral and what is the cathedral is in the catacombic it's just that when the high priest or whatever you want to call them the people at the top want to territorialize you and don't allow for any deterritorialization sure that's when it becomes sort of oppressive and so you need to always listen to that how that tells you that they folded me wrongfully mm -hmm. and and it's not like you can come up with a perfect way of folding it right and then it will shut up because it's process it's becoming right and so we can never settle for anything and that's unsettling for some people i guess <laughs> it ought to be 
Oh yeah, I was thinking also. Um, whenever I, I think of the body without organs, I've I like to go back earlier, and it's not that earlier, but to to Guattari's notion of transversality, um, and also Deleuze's notion of the larval subject or the embryonic. Um, I think both of those are are sort of hinting <laughs> at the emergence of the body without organs as a concept. Um, although Guattari was talking about transversality within institutional settings a few years before he actually met and teamed up with Deleuze. And then Deleuze and Difference and Repetition, four years before Anti-Oedipus was published, I think, um, was talking about this notion of a larval subject. Um, and I talked about it in the lecture a little bit too. I think that they, they were both getting at, at what they were trying to to conceive of with respect to uh, uh, deterritorializing forces and emphasis on becoming as a sort of way of going about subjectivity. And I don't know. I just I think it's important. I, I like to follow the genealogy of of the ideas and stuff. And this is maybe just the, the neglected historian in me or something. But but I figured it would at least be worth mentioning that. If the body without organs is still confusing um, for some of those who 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 are new to Deleuze and Guattari's language, because we all once were at some point in time, I, I think that they can either go back to Guattari's earlier text, um, psychoanalysis and transversality. Um, you get some much much more practically written essays there. Yeah. Maybe you can talk a little bit more about transversality and try to unpack that. Right. Yeah, that's true. Um, because because when we started talking about doing this, you said let's talk about Guattari because the <laughs> podcast has had quite an emphasis on Deleuze, and it's always like almost like Deleuze is sort of the main guy, right? And Guattari is just this crazy guy in yeah. the background, <laughs> yeah. roaming he, around. He's sort of in the parentheses. He's yeah, yes. this other French guy. But he's he's of... important for this, and I mean, let's talk about him and sort of transversality. It's a concept, and then. Uh, related to his work at Labor and, and okay. the practical side of it. Okay. Um, all right. So for, first and foremost, um, from from what I've understood, what I've researched, transversality was a notion um, that was referred to uh, by Jean Claude Pollock, who was a, a clinician. He's still alive, um, still practicing, but he was a clinician also at Labor. Um, and Guattari's adaptation of it, I can't tell you to what extent it differentiates from Pollock's because I haven't been able to read much of his work because a lot of it's not translated into English yet. Um, so what I'm working with exclusively is uh, Guattari's adaptation of it, which obviously that's okay. That's who we want to talk about. But I figured as a disclaimer, I would say that Jean-Claude Pollock had talked about it, you know, first. But um, anyways, uh, so so Guattari's notion of transversality, he so he doesn't he proposes it as a uh, sort of institutional process or a greater collective group uh, sort of process and he juxtaposes it to um, this notion of hierarchized I don't know if I'm saying that rise but a, a hierarchy way of looking about movements and in institutional settings you know so the very uh, basic um, superstructure infrastructural sort of levels um, to how structures are organized, how institutions are formed and navigated. And he proposes this idea of uh, transversality or um, transversal movements, which is essentially just, I mean, it's, it's, it's commonsensically just the ability to move in any, between any frame of reference, uh, between any level or structure, so to speak. I, I guess it was especially useful at the Labord Clinic um, with their implementation of the grid system, which was a, a, a sort of very straightforward uh, system in which the uh, the jobs or the duties of the grounds of the clinic were, were sort of divvied up and uh, debated amongst patients, nurses, doctors, so on and so, so on and so forth. There was no real established hierarchy between who could do which job and who couldn't do which job. I mean, it was a primordial, quote unquote, or primitive, sorry, uh, sort of community formation. And he thought it was important for the formation of a subject group contra a subjugated group 
that there be these uh, coefficients of transversality, which is just the freedom of these movements, um, allowing for these different planes to open up for a catatonic patient um, once coming out of a spell of catatonia to be able to run an art clinic or to be able to cook or to be able to clean if they wanted to do it and so on and so forth. So it was very, very practical, very basic. Um, I can feel the Nietzsche in me speaks now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's there for sure. Yeah, because you have the different perspectives. And so you can't allow for someone to just to be put in place. And this is your perspective on things. Right. They need to be able to move around, even within themselves, which is, you know, when you talk about sort of an intersubjectivity of the self. Right. You get that in everyone, but with with schizophrenics, I guess it's more apparent than with, you know, your normal healthy person. Yeah, the quote unquote neurotic. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I think too, I mean, it so it almost sounds commonsensical when I read it, this idea of transversality. Well, yeah, of course, I could see how that would be useful, but when we sort of consider it in its original context, um, when we think about how psychiatric health has evolved and devolved in many ways. Um, you know, you go from age of confinement and Fu, when Foucault talks about it, we just lock them up and then very slowly, but surely we get to the, the, you know, neurobiological and the sort of locating, uh, mental illnesses and disease and brain chemistry and so on. And then you have psychoanalysis, which is on the cusp of that as well. Um, with their, Although free form to a certain degree, you know, Guattari talks about it all the time. There was still always the, you know, the gaze of psychoanalysts behind the couch. Um, it was very still formulaic with how the sessions had to be laid out and so on and so forth. So for him um, to allow transversal movements to come into the clinic, um, Jean-Henri also believed in it. That, that was something that they felt was a little bit more radical. Um, and it's funny because... At a conference, Anne Kerienne, she's a sociologist um, in France who Deleuze and Guattari cite a couple of times. Um, she had the opportunity to be at the Laborde Clinic when uh, Guattari was still around. And uh, we, we just asked her how it was at a conference in, in London. Um, and she said it was chaotic. She said, you know, they're all over the place. We try to form a group. And next thing you know, a patient would run through it and rip <laughs> something down. And, and it was just, and you think about it like, for for me, that's something that's that's what I deal with on a daily basis in the classroom, you know, given what what I've told you my background is and stuff. It's so it was so comical, but also refreshing to know that this institutional setting, something I'm very much familiar with and embedded in, is what uh, you know was the the driving force behind this theoretical movement or this 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 concept, so to speak. And and there was also the emphasis on group therapy rather than individual therapy. Right. Can you right, speak on right. that? Yeah. Well. Yeah. It was always so the, the their notion of the institution. Um, it doesn't have the same connotation uh, that it does in the English. An institution in in the English language is something gets instituted, structured, formed. Um, institution in the French language, at least how they use it. And this is uh, from what I've heard from my French friends, because my French is awful. Um, it's, it's, it's a little bit more institutions pop up, uh, almost haphazardly and very, in an embryonic way, very organically, um, whenever slight groups form, or even, uh, an institution can pop up within individuals with themselves, as you said, when they're doing this intersubjective collective dialogue with themselves. But but yeah, there was an emphasis on on bringing in uh, uh, sort of doing doing group analyses and and ensuring that you're not going one on one and you're not able to to uh, and I feel Guata, the way Guattari felt about the one on one clinical session, um, he just felt it was too much of a power dynamic, too much of a, a shift towards the analyst and the analyst and um, I don't think he liked. But I don't think I know he didn't like the 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 implications of that sort of uh, one on one head to head relationship. And so um, within the collective setting, he felt this notion of who the analyzer was becomes uh, a, a little a little bit more unsure um, who the analyst is and who the analyst and is within a group session. Um, gets a little bit blurred, which is a good thing when you're when you're thinking of of what Guattari is trying to do politically um, 
in the formation of groups and so on and so forth. He, he's trying to steer away, obviously, from the, the formation of a subjugated group with a tribe mentality, with a leader, with a capital S signifier, dictator, so on and so forth. So I think the group, he just felt there was, uh, there was the, more checks and balances. I hate to use that, that uh, phrase, but um, it, it surely was. When I read about this and compare it to the situation in Sweden, I can only think that anything that Guattari was up to would be illegal in Sweden because we're all about order. Right. Just to move this along, one concept that comes up in, in my mind when I listen to you talk now is the the priesthood of all believers. Yeah. So there's a sort of connection to to Christianity that we could make use of perhaps. But also, you know, I see in my mind when I listen to you, sort of the archbishop facing the Pope and suddenly a mad person just runs into the room and starts screaming about something totally distant <laughs> to the conversation in the room. <laughs> and that would never happen. <laughs> they'd be removed. They'd be removed. They'd be crucified. The church or Christianity functions very much like the institutions that put Christ on the cross. For sure. I just think uh, the church has a lot to learn from Gotari here. So maybe, you know, I asked you before about relating the body without organs to the body with Christ. So can we make a connection here? Yeah, yeah, we can, we can draw it back. So for, for me, in the body of Christ um, is the church, so to speak. Um, if, if I mean the body of Christ is many things, I guess to the to the the typical believer. But assuming that this this line between body of Christ and the church can be made, and then my question was, although I only you know propose it very briefly in that talk, is how do we make the church then a body without organs, um, which is co almost counterintuitive and paradoxical, right? I mean the the, the church and all the the, the loaded. The loadedness that comes with that sort of terminology, nothing about it is anti-organism, is uh, um, anti-signifiance or or against that. So I don't know. I, I I'm not sure what the answer would be and how you do do that, but I think it's a necessary question to ask. And I think um, within radical theological movements and then uh, attempts have been made to form collectives that are uh, more open to to uh, the establishment or the opening up of these different uh, fields of, of becoming um, a virtuality of uh, certain lines of flight. You, you allow those to, to manifest within this church space. Um, and so in that way, I think, I think the church should look, uh, and granted, it's uh, on a very it's very idiosyncratic, so it depends on on certain institutions. Uh, Guattari himself didn't advocate that the Laborde clinic be used as a model for all clinics, but it's a meta model in the same way that schizoanalysis is a meta model. And by that, he just means it's it's it can fluctuate based on whatever practice you're faced with. Your theory should change and adapt to the needs of the you know the very material needs of what you're dealing with. But for the church, for me, then. Um, I think could learn from the board, um, even if it doesn't mean adopting a grid system or adopting that we all sit in a circle and do group therapy in this way. But I think just the, this notion of care that's at the heart of of what I've read about Guattari's work at the Laborde Clinic, that sort of goes hand in hand with at least what I think um, making the body of Christ a body without organs would entail. And so there's this excerpt from a thousand plateaus that I that I feel is is relevant for for any conversation um, with respect to uh, religious discourse or theological debates or whatever. Okay, so we we are referring here to religion as an element in a war machine, and the idea of holy war as the motor of that machine. The prophet, as opposed to the state personality of the king and the religious personality of the priest, directs the movement by which a religion becomes a war machine or passes over to the side of such a machine. The prophets may very well condemn nomad life. The war machine may very well favor the movement on migration and the ideal of establishment. 
religion in general may very well compensate for its specific deterritorialization with a spiritual and even physical reterritorialization, which in the case of the Holy War assumes the well-directed character of a conquest of the Holy Lands as the center of the world. Um, despite all that, when religion sets itself up as a war machine, it mobilizes and liberates a formidable charge of nomads, nomadism or absolute deterritorialization. It doubles the migrant with an accompanying nomad or with the potential nomad the migrant is in the process of becoming. And finally, it turns its dream of an absolute state back against the state form. That with me, like despite, despite how obviously atheistic um, um, Deleuze is, and that little blip when, when they sort of postulate how religion itself functions as a, as a war machine through the words of a prophet as opposed to a priest, I think that that's, although a dichotomy, a sharp one, I think it's still potentially a useful one whenever, you know, we're engaging and trying to form collectives, trying to deal with the church body and so on and so forth, what the implications are for considering ourselves to be more of a prophet or priestly. Okay, so so how do you think, you know, in an actual, because in theory, this sounds really good of course, yeah. but yeah. but but in practice and so we talked about this sort of theory practice uh, that we need to relate them to each other and so how how could we do this in a actual church setting how do you deterritorialize the church sort of deal with that chunk i'll be very literal and i think you literally have to um destroy the the the, the boundaries or what the territory of the church is, so to speak, um, in order for it to be done. So, I mean, that's sort of a very cheap linguistic trick, I guess I, I pulled. Um, but, but, but for me, you know, I, I, the, the church is still too, it's too priestly. Um, whether it's, it's sort of re refocusing and illustrating the extent to which the church is in fact a catacomb or the catacomb is in fact a church. Um, for me, it's just uh, finding um, or forming collectives or institutions that are are oriented around the that same sentiment of of care, um, of of affirmation for differences and for 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 openings and singularities and um, the proliferation of various subjectivities. That, for me, is what a deterritorialization of the church might look like, which may be a, uh, a collective group of people who put together a web page and are trying to to share theory and and practice and whatever, um, or it could you know find its find itself uh, in a completely different setting. Um, I, re I really have no idea. <laughs> Let's talk about atheism then, if you just ne negate whatever the theologian or the priesthood are saying. Sure. And if you look to, I mean, as we talked about in America, you have a sort of rising of the nuns. Right. Not the nuns, but the nuns right. at the moment. In Europe, a movement going back a few hundred years, revolting against the church. Uh, however, I would claim that atheism is a kind of Christianity because it's a negation of the Christian God. It's not a negation of some other God, although they want to talk about spaghetti monsters or whatever. <laughs> They're a negation of the Christian faith. I just want to lay out a, a thing from Henri Bergson because we also said we we're going to talk about Bergson. Right. I love Bergson. He's, he's my, one of my heroes. Okay, so Bergson says people will confuse the less with the more. Uh, and that's a big issue that, that, that enslaves us to bad metaphysical questions. And to talk about this theism-atheism thing in Bergsonian terms would be to say that what is sort of presupposed by Europeans then as the neutral starting ground is atheism. But that's confusing the less with the more, because the idea of theism is the idea of theism. The idea of atheism is the idea of theism, the idea of the negation of theism, and the reasoning for why making that negation. Right. And so the idea of atheism is actually a much larger idea 
than the idea of theism. To presume that atheism is a neutral starting ground and theism is a higher idea, a bigger idea, something that needs explanation, is to confuse the less with the more. And by making that confusion between the less and the more, we become enslaved by the sort of structure mm-hmm. that we're trying to oppose. And, and I mean, this is basically Nietzschean, I think. Oh, yeah, it's uh, that was and I'm, I'm not as well, probably not as well read in Nietzsche as, as you, you are. But it yeah, it sounds like it to me, for sure. My, my critique towards secularism hasn't necessarily been uh, framed in that way that they are, you know, just falling back into the, the slave master um, dialectic that further enslaves them to who is defining the discourse because they're just trying to simply negate it and say that they're wrong. Um, they're not really offering any uh, positive affirmation of, of what their standpoint is in any way independent from what they're, what they're sort of uh, batting back up against. Um, I guess for me, the, the, the critique of secularism that I've always had is that it's, 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 it, it doesn't move far away enough from the the theological uh, transcendent viewpoint that they're attempting to to uh, differentiate themselves from, um, and I, and I see this especially I guess in 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 uh, folks like Hitchens, um, Dawkins, uh, Krauss, some of the the new atheist folks who who um, are secularists insofar as that they you know try to just appeal to material things that, that aren't based in some sort of transcendence. But they typically uh, switch the placeholder, as you mentioned in the prologue, um, and uh, science or a scientific method um, takes on the sort of uh, the same aura of being uh, canonized and, and holy in a certain way. Um, and they don't necessarily go far enough uh, with it, with their skepticism and their debates uh, against against that and what the the problem with 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 that is um oh and then i think also the move from uh the theological so to speak to the secular if if that's a proper dichotomy or or whatever i'm not sure binary um i think there's also the problem with with uh where the the oppressor is um it becomes difficult to locate so the seculars would say well you're obviously confined and oppressed by uh, this God that you believe in that isn't there and it shouldn't be. And so, you know, if, if you orient yourself in a secular way towards the material, then you, you'll, you know, it's more liberating, so to speak. But as I said, because of the way in which that they, the secularist is typically also um, in a positive relationship, so to speak, with, with scientific scientific methodologies and so on and so forth, then the influx of these other means of oppression that are uh, the, their power relations are a little bit harder to disentangle, um, i.e., uh, the, the advancements in medical um, technologies, um, technology in general, in terms of like cybernetics, things like that. Um, it, it reminds me of of what Foucault talks about, or not Foucault, sorry, what Zizek talks about with respect to the postmodern father. And how the modernist father is somebody who uh, was far more plain in their language and telling their kid that, you know, I don't want you to do this because I said so. Let's say you have a good old fashioned father. It's Sunday afternoon. You have to visit grandma. The father, good old fashioned authoritarian father will tell you, listen, I don't care how you feel if you are a small kid, of course. Mm-hmm. I don't have, ha- care how you feel. You have to go. You're going. Gra- go with grandmother and behave there properly. Okay. That's good. You can resist. Uh, no, nothing is broken. But let's say you have this so-called tolerant postmodern father. What he will tell you is the following. You know how much your grandmother loves you, but nonetheless, you should only visit her if you really want to. Now, every child who is not an idiot, and they are not idiots, (laughs) know that this apparent free choice secretly contains an even more more stronger, much stronger order. It's not only you have to visit your grandmother, but you have to like it. I'm beginning to like this book all the more. That's one example of how apparent 
tolerance, choice, and so on, can conceal a much stronger, a much stronger order. Another so we should go back to more like the dad that just says, because I said so. Absolutely. It's more honest. You can tell where the command is coming from, who's directing it, and there, there's no if, ands, or buts about who is the one forcing your hand, um, whereas the postmodern father, and I think that this sort of gets Trojan horsed into the secularist movement, that transcendence finds its way into um, the secularist reactions. Um, it comes through a postmodern father, like Gizek talks about, when the, the father tells his son, you know, Although you don't have to go see your grandmother, you know, you don't have you don't have to do anything like that. You have um, your own decisions to make your own life to live. Um, I, I'd be really disappointed. You know, I think she really wants to see you. Um, she's going to pass away soon. You know, all of these other more subtle ways of of Trojan horsing in the guilt or or the uh, the that super egoic function. And I think the losing Guattari talk about. Uh, how capitalism does it perfectly and so on and so forth. So this was what I was talking about in the opening of the episode where I said that where I quoted Deleuze saying the only change is this instead of being burdened from the outside, man takes the weight and places them on his own back. Internalize. Yeah. And what it, yeah, internalize it. And so you get the this whole conversation about the unconscious and and I said something there about uh, the unconscious keeps echoing the life-denying verdicts of the imperial Christian God. Right. And I mean, that's what Zizek is talking about in, right. in, in, in what you're saying, although he talks about a situation in a family. Right. But it's still the sort of internalization of the Christian God. Not that much has happened when we moved from Christianity to secularism. Right. And that's why I think then Deleuze and Guattari go a step further um, towards reversing uh the damage done by descartes when they say that there there is no subject or that the subject is obviously so collectively oriented there is no independent individualized static consistent uh subject i think something worth returning to when you said say there is no such thing as as the subject or the subject as as the one perhaps we want to say the individual the indivisible one right of me that's an illusion, as, you know, Jim Carrey said. <laughs> what? I've covered a lot of fashion weeks. This is the first time I've run in to Jim Carrey. Wait, tell me, is it true you're wandering the streets? You need a date to the party? What's up? No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm doing just fine. Uh, I just, uh, you know, there's no meaning to any of this. So I, uh, I wanted to find the most meaningless thing that I could f come to and join. And, uh, and, uh, and here I am. They're celebrating. I mean, you got to admit, it's completely meaningless. Well, they say they're celebrating icons inside. Celebrating Do you icons. In icons. Boy, that is just the absolute lowest aiming, you know, possibility that we could come up with. It's like icons. What do you do? You believe in icons? I don't I believe in personalities. I don't believe that you exist. But there is a, a wonderful fragrance in the air. You don't believe certain icons have the power to make change, to think differently, to be bold, to inspire others? Artistry? You're one of them. On the good foot. Ha! Yeah. You shut her down now. Yeah, no, I, uh, I, I don't believe in icons. Uh, I don't believe in personalities. I believe that peace lies beyond personality, beyond invention and disguise, beyond the red S that you wear on your chest that makes bullets bounce off. I believe that it's deeper than that. I believe we're a field of energy dancing for itself. And uh, I don't care. But Jim, you got really dressed up for the occasion. You look good. No, Was I didn't that an get accident? dressed up. I didn't get dressed Who up. Who did? There, there is no me. There's no you. No. We're not here. This is a dream? There's just things happening. And there are clusters of tetrahedrons moving around together. Okay. Yeah. So what's happening in our world right now? Because there is a lot of news that actually is relevant that's not that yeah. Here's uplifting. Here's the thing. It's not our world. None that's of this is key. real? Nope. nope. So you're just passing We don't through. matter. We don't matter. Oh, wow. There's the good news. Okay. It's meaningless. Uh, but, but the thing is, we, we might want to be careful here because there's always the risk of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. I'm not sure if if there is no subject, but but I know that, that that's where Deleuze and Guattari go. You know, they go to the transhuman, posthuman 
uh, uh, machines. Um, I, I, I'm not, I don't know if I'm necessarily convinced, um, as much as they are, I, I do like some of the implications of, of why, or I understand why they go that route and the implications of that theoretical movement, I think can be, uh, useful, both theologically, politically, academically, so on. Um, but it is a very delicate gray area to try and navigate. Um, again, becoming a body without organs doesn't mean you literally empty out your organs to the point of, uh, suicide or, um, you know, death. Yeah. So here, here, here's a quote from Deleuze and Guattari, a thousand plateaus. Staying stratified, organized, signified, subjected is not the worst that can happen. Right. The worst that can happen is that you throw the strata into demented or suicidal collapse. Right. And so what we said before about the organism has to reform each dawn. Right. It's the same passage. Right. We have to keep part of the organism even to turn ourselves against the organization itself, right. the system that is oppressing us. Right. If we just throw everything into what they say, then de demented or suicidal collapse, we can't oppose it. Right. And so I think this is something I've been invested in a few conversations with different groups and email lists and whatever. Uh, and they've been talking about a lot about Jordan Peterson. Because Jordan Peterson simply dismisses postmodernism and poststructuralism and every French thinker very sort of sweepingly. Okay. See, the postmodernists completely reject the structure of Western civilization. And I mean completely. Jacques Derrida, who's head trickster for the postmodernist movement, regarded Western culture, let's call it the patriarchy, as phallogocentric. Okay, so fallow comes from phallus, P-H-A-L-L-O. And so that's the insistence that what you see in Western culture is the consequence of a male-dominated, oppressive, uh, self-serving society. And there are no shortage of flaws in the manner in which we've structured our society. And compared to any hypothetical utopia, it's an absolutely dismal wreck. But compared to the rest of the world and the plight of other societies throughout the history of mankind, we're doing pretty damn well, and we should be happy to be living in the society that we're living in. So the first thing that you might want to note about postmodernism is that it doesn't have a shred of gratitude. And there's something pathologically wrong with a person who does have, doesn't have any gratitude, especially when they live in what so far is the best of all possible worlds. And so if you're not grateful, you're driven by resentment. And resentment is about the worst emotion that you can possibly experience apart from arrogancy. Resentment, arrogance, and deceit. There's an evil triad for you. And if you're bitter about everything that's happening around you, despite the fact that you're bathed in wealth, then there's something absolutely wrong with you. So you have to educate yourself about postmodernism. Okay, so here's what the postmodernists believe. They don't believe in the individual. That's the logos part. Western culture is fell logocentric. Logo is logos. They don't believe in logic. They believe that logic is part of the process by which the patriarchal institutions of the West continue to dominate and to justify their dominance. They don't believe in dialogue. The root word of dialogue is logos again. They don't believe that people of goodwill can come to consensus through the, ex through the exchange of ideas. They believe that that notion is part of the s philosophical substructure and practices of the dominant culture. So the reason they don't let people who they don't agree with speak on campus is because they don't agree with letting people speak. You see, it's not part of the ethos. And I think, I think he has a good point in his critique against some of postmodern thinking, because I think that that's what they're doing. It's been too effective mm. in dismantling and in, in destabilizing, mm -hmm. and there's nothing in it that want to keep anything. And so you want to break every norm. You want to break up every identity. Right. And that's sort of, that's a sort of demented or suicidal collapse that they're right, wanting right. to go towards. And that's the death drive. Right, right. And you need that. Right. But you can't have only that. Going back to Nietzsche, it's not at all about Dionysus. It's also about Apollo. And you need that interplay. You can't just go with one or the other. Right. And I think that's Peterson's critique against postmodernism. Right. He thinks everyone's just 
sort of drunken spirited Dionysians. Right. Well, I think, and that's, that's the issue too with, uh, Nick Land and his accelerationist use of the losing Guattari to the point of fever pitch, suicide, death, kill everything, accelerate it until, you know, the world explodes type of thing. There, there is that destructiveness in the losing Guattari. I mean, there is that anarcho capitalism, destroy everything. It's there. Yes. But as, as we've quoted the, these two quotes, I mean, they're, they're big quotes and they're the, the placement within those plateaus, I think are, they're, it's optimal. It, it, they obviously are, and I've watched some um, interviews of Deleuze, they're obviously very, uh, they approach the topic with great trepidation when they're asked about it. Um, Deleuze, I remember watching an interview and he talked about certain students who, you know, had wanted to get into experimenting with drugs, you know, accelerating that uh, liberative, you know, sort of charting down that line of flight like crazy. And he, he was, uh, he said, I mean, sure, do it, but, but he was also wanting to say, like, I don't want you to lose your life to a drug either. You know, there's there's um, we're not simply saying just to go balls to the wall, do whatever the hell you want. There's a quote of Deleuze. I think that fits with what we were just talking about, about, you know, the these these the desire of affirmation um, and and the, the the weird blend of it with destructiveness. And that is not just all about accelerating things to, to obliterate the current world in its entirety. Um, so I just wanted a, a quick quote of his. It's from, uh, it's in his Desert Islands, the collected early essays of his. And it says, if you don't admire something, if you don't love it, you have no reason to write a word about it. Um, Spinoza or Nietzsche are philosophers whose critical and destructive powers are without equal. But this power always springs from affirmation, from joy, from a cult of affirmation and joy, from the exigency of life against those who would mutilate it and mortal mortify it. For me, that is philosophy itself.